My name's Caleb. If you are new, so glad you're here. One of the pastors here at Project Church. And uh, we've been in a series in the book of Genesis. We've been walking chapter by chapter to the book of Genesis. And man, really got a lot out of this. In fact, I was trying to fast forward to get to the end of Genesis by Easter. So Easter is a week from next Sunday, so two weeks from today. Um, but then God kept like saying, I want you to do a little more, a little more. And so uh, we're going to close out Genesis after Easter. We have a relationship series. And then after that, uh, those four weeks of a relationship series, we'll close out Genesis with the book of, or not the book of, but the story of Joseph. So we're going to do three, four weeks on the story of Joseph. But today I am going to talk to you one more time about the life of Jacob. Uh, you guys have been hearing about Jacob for the last several weeks. If you missed any of them, I encourage you, you can go back, watch them on YouTube, uh, watch or listen on our podcast on iTunes or Spotify. But Chrissy last week shared a powerful word on the time when Jacob actually wrestled with God physically. And uh, something that I've really never heard preached uh, or not preached well, but she did an amazing job. And I would encourage you to go back and listen. But I want to kind of set up this final message looking at the story of Jacob here today, the life of Jacob. You see, Jacob has wrestled his whole life. In fact, his name means supplanter or deceiver because he starts out his life by holding on to his brother Esau's heel. He's trying to get out first. And then you heard a few weeks back where as they grow in age, he steals or, or, or tricks Esau out of the birthright and then steals the blessing by tricking their father. So Esau his whole life had been wrestling. It's interesting because actually as we study this story, we know that he runs from Esau for his life at the age of 77, which is when he then 20 years later wrestles with God physically at the age of 97. This is when he reconciles with Esau. And what's interesting is he reconciles with Esau. There's forgiveness, uh, which we talked about two weeks ago. And then he finally enters into the promised land. So I don't know if you've ever experienced this in your life, but like you've made a lot of bad decisions. You've been through some struggles. You've been through some issues. But then finally, it's like you get it right. You start to live uh, your life on the straight and narrow. And you think you've arrived. And then what happens? Another problem, another storm, another struggle. Jacob goes through a lot in his life, doesn't he? First, he works after running from Esau. He works for seven years for a wife named Rachel, only to be tricked. His father-in-law, Laban, pulls the old switcheroo on him. In the middle of the night, gives her older sister, Leah, to him. So then he has to work another seven years. And then after that, he works another six years. So 20 years he works, he toils until he finally has this reuniting, this redemption moment, this forgiveness moment with Esau. And then what we see here is after Esau forgives him, he steps into the promised land, into Canaan. And he walks into this new city, arrives at Shechem in Canaan, and he pays for a a plot of ground. And he pitches his tent and says, we're going to dwell here. We're going to dwell in this land. We've arrived. Things are going well. I finally got my life together. I'm finally making right decisions. I've reunited with my brother. There's been forgiveness. Things are going amazing. And he walks into the promised land. And what happens? His daughter Dinah is out in the field one day. And the son of the mayor of the city of Shechem takes her and rapes her in this field. Takes advantage of her, defiles her. And he doesn't know what to do because he's in this land not his own. He's finally thinking things are going well. And and he has this defiling moment happen to his daughter. So he waits for Levi and Simeon, his sons, to come back home. They've been out in the fields, and they get home, and they're incensed. They're angry, and so they hash a plot without Jacob knowing because they know that this man who's raped their sister wants to marry her, 
So he comes to them and says, listen, I want to marry your sister. Can I have your permission? Uh, I'll take her as my wife. And then we want to intermarry with your family. Uh, let the men of this town, because they've grown in numbers. They say, we'll trade livestock with you. And so Levi and Simeon hash this plan. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good with that, but you have to do something that we do. You have to circumcise all the men of your town. And they say, okay, we'll do it. Which is crazy, because some of you won't even go to next steps. <laughs> and they're like, get circumcised, we'll do it. That's, that's wild. And so they do it. They're circumcised, circumcised. And on the third day of their recovery, Levi and Simeon sneak into the city with a bunch of men and they kill every single man of the city of Shechem. Murder all of them as they're in agony and pain recovering. And then they take all their wives, all their children, all their livestock as their possession. And that's what brings us here to Genesis chapter 34. I'm going to read verse 30. This is Jacob's response to his sons and this plan that they've hashed. He says, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. And if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So you know what I call this? I call this a promised land problem. Because you ever feel like you've arrived? You've gotten through the struggles. You've gotten through the storms. You've wrestled with a lot of things. You and God have got things right. You're finally walking the straight and narrow path. You're finally doing things the way you knew you should have been doing them all those years after a series and years of bad decisions. And you arrive at what seems like the promised land. And then what are you presented with? Another problem. But this time it was not your own doing. It actually wasn't even your fault. So my Bible in the ESV, it actually labels this section of scripture of chapter 34. It calls it the defiling of Dinah. And so I want to share a message with you if you're taking notes entitled defiled destiny. You see, he's in the place that God had promised him. He's in the promised land. And yet now he's in the greatest danger of his life. And this time it wasn't his fault. Outside of his control. And I think some of you can relate to this because you're finally living your life in line with God. You think you're doing things the right way. And now you find yourself in the middle of another fight. Another storm. You feel like, God, my destiny has been defiled again. And so I want to encourage you, and I want you to hear this today. A defiled destiny does not define your destiny. Because some of you are in the middle of what you think was you stepped into the destiny, you stepped into the purpose, you stepped into, man, I'm finally made it, I'm finally in the promised land, and then another defiling happens. And you start to think that that is now what your definition is for the destiny that God has for you. That this is all I am. This is all I can be. But God wanted to tell you today, it may be defiled, but it's not defining your story. So let's read Genesis 35, because what I want to share with you is how we should respond when our destiny feels defiled. How should we respond when our destiny feels defiled? And I know we can all relate to this because we've all walked through things that people did to us when we were trying to do the right thing. So let's read. Here's how God instructs Jacob to respond to this defiling at the hands of not just the men of this land who've defiled his daughter, but now Levi and Simeon in their act that has caused this land, now they're going to come for Jacob and his family. Verse 1 of 35. Are you with me? 
There we go. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you. And when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household, to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. She was buried under an oak below Bethel, so he called its name Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. And kings shall come from your own body. Amen. Today, I want to talk to you about how to respond when our destiny feels defiled. First, we need to go where God sends. I'm talking about obedience. I'm talking about when God says to go, even if the place he's telling us to go doesn't make sense, we still go. Verse 1, God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Throw that up for them. Verse 1, I need them to see it. I want you to see what happens here. Jacob has been to Bethel before. That's what it says. The first time he goes to Bethel, he's running from his brother Esau. This time, it's where God is telling him to go. What do I believe God is saying to us here? That we have to allow God to bring us back to the place of our greatest fear. Listen to me. Some of you have tried to push away, to push down, to suppress what you walked through all those years back. To suppress your lowest point, to suppress the pain and the storm that you walk through in the worst moments of your life. But sometimes God asks us to go back so that we can remember what he did. That if he had us at our lowest point, then he's got something great for us in store in the future. You need to receive this today because some of you have just kept that hidden. You've kept that suppressed. You've ignored it all these years. But maybe God is asking you to go back and to build an altar to him in this place. He says, go back to Bethel, which I don't know if you've seen. There's actually a lot of churches that are named Bethel. In fact, my grandfather took over a church here in Sacramento 40 plus years ago. And it was called Bethel Temple at the time. And then he changed the name to Capital Christian Center. My grandfather did. But Bethel, you know what Bethel means? It means the dwelling place of God, the house of God. So he says, I want you to go back to this place where you were running from your brother. You were at your lowest point. You were all alone. You were fearful for your life. You had nothing left, no possessions. You were desperate. I want you to go back to that place. I want you to build an altar in the moment of your greatest fear. Some of you need to hear this, that the defiling you've experienced is a delay, but it's not the destroyer of your destiny. You've been defiled. Your destiny's been defiled. And it feels like it's been destroyed, but it's not a destroyer. It's often a delayer. And sometimes God wants us to go back and build an altar. An altar was a place of remembrance. An altar was a place of sacrifice. He wanted him to go back, build an altar, sacrifice. Why? So he could remember what God had done at his lowest point. 
Now, I'm not telling you to go back there and dwell there because some of you have dwelled in the place of your lowest point. You've dwelled in the place of your greatest failure. You've dwelled in the place of your shame, and that has become your identity. God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to go there and give him praise that he didn't leave you there, but he's brought you to a better place. Somebody here needs to just give God some praise right now. We're going to take five second praise break and thank God that he brought you out of your lowest point in your life and you're not where you want to be, but at least you're not where you used to be. Why does God allow bad things to happen? That's the question I get a lot. I've actually preached the whole message on that before. Why would a loving God allow bad things to happen to good people. First of all, biblically, we know there are no good people. <laughs> For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. We're all filthy rags in the eyes of God. So when people say that to me, I say, well, you're not good. I'm not good. No one's good. They're like, well, I'm good compared to him. But how many of you know that's subjective? But the reason God often allows the things that he allows, first of all, is because he's not created robots. And he's given us all free will. And unfortunately, in free will comes abuse. You know that with freedom comes abuse, right? You create freedom, just look at our country, there will come abuse. And so he's given us free will and we abuse one another. But what's crazy about God is he can work all things together for the good of those who love him. So he can take your greatest test and turn it into your testimony. He can take your greatest storm and give him glory through it. He can actually take the lowest point, your greatest fear like Jacob experienced, and bring him back to it and remind him and say, listen, I'm taking you back there because you're fearful again, but it's nothing compared to how you were. You got way more now. I've got way, way more in you. I've blessed you in so many other ways. And so listen, if I got you through that, I'll definitely get you through this. So hear me, church. You just need to obey. When God says go, go. Go where God sends you because it's much better to be in God's will in a place you never thought you'd be, then the place you think is best outside of his will. I've tried it in my, I've tried it my way, church, like Frank Sinatra used to sing about. I tried it my way. Can I tell you, God's way is always better than our way. So go where he sends. This is our response when it feels like our destiny has been defiled. The second response is that we would eliminate the idols from our life. I know you're saying, Caleb, like, that's Old Testament talk. We don't have idols today. <laughs> yes, we do. The idols just look different. They maybe aren't carven images. They're maybe not golden statues. But they're idols of our own making. We've turned money into an idol. We've turned possessions into an idol. We've turned grinding into an idol. We turn what we build into idols. We can even turn our children into idols, parents. Where we worship at the altar of our children, whatever they want, say, goes, as if I don't rule and lead my family. Come on, parents. I don't care how cute Johnny is. He doesn't run your house. You do, man of God. You do, woman of God. So I prioritize the house of God. Johnny got a game, but Johnny needs to get his butt to church because he ain't going pro anyways. Let's be real. He ain't going pro, church. Get his butt in church. Okay, I'm going off script now. Come on. He might. He might. We're praying for him. He might go pro. There's a .02% chance. <laughs> I'm playing with you. You know that the best way to step into the new season that God is calling to is from a place of purity. And I think we want the new seasons. We want the new blessings. 
We want God to pour out overflow into our lives. And yet we still got all this stuff hidden under the surface. Like I actually thought about Jacob because I'm like, oh man, Jacob's really gotten it together finally. Right? Him and Esau, their relationship's been restored and there's been forgiveness. He's, uh, he's not tricking and deceiving people anymore. And, and now he, he even has separated from his father-in-law where there was major family dysfunction there. And he's separated and now he's got his own family and he's going to the promised land. And, and, and now he's stepping into this new season, the new promise. I'm like, man, Jacob's finally got it together. But then did you see what happened in verse 2? He actually speaks to his whole household, his children, his servants. And he says to them, put away the foreign gods that are among you. And purify yourselves and change your garments. You see, we need to step into a place of purity to receive the blessings of the new season that God has for us. And unfortunately in the church, we don't want to talk about living pure. We don't want to talk about living right. We don't want to talk about living in line with God's word. We just want to tell you things that make you feel good. And you walk out of here, but you know if you've been coming here long enough, I mean, you're a glutton, glutton for punishment, because I'm not standing up here just tickling your ears. I'm calling you to a higher place, a higher standard, because that's what I believe God has for his people. He's called us to be set apart, different from this world. We need to eliminate the idols that we have in our lives. And I love what happens here. He actually says, I need you to take the idols. I need you to give them to me. And then in verse 5 uh, or verse 4, it says that he takes their rings, their gods, um, the things in their ears, and he buries them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. So I want to ask you, what do you need to bury in your life? What idols? What sin? What things that have you in bondage do you need to bury today? Listen to me. There are people around you that you're allowing to have access to your life that have idols or even demonic practices at work in their life. And you don't realize how it's impacting you. Jacob maybe wasn't worshiping foreign gods anymore. Jacob maybe didn't have idols in his life. But even his servants and his family members, he goes, I need you to give them to me. We're going to bury them. I don't want anyone in my life that's carrying anything that's going to hinder the promises, the destiny that God has for me. So I know you got some friends who are spiritual and they be playing around with astrology and tarot cards and horoscopes and palm readers. But if you're in my life, I'm telling you right now, you're going to put that away. We're burying that. People will tell me, oh, I knew you were a Leo. You're an August birthday, aren't you? I knew you were Leo. I was like, I don't play with that. Get thee behind me, horoscope Satan. <laughs> there may be even people in your life that you've allowed to have access, that have idols, things that are not of God, that you need to say, look, if you're in my life, you need to get that out. I'm not saying we don't love those who are far from God. I'm not saying we don't build relationships with people that don't know Jesus. But some of you, are close with people who are influencing you more than you're influencing them and pulling you away from the destiny, defiling the destiny that God has for your life. So what are you wearing? What do you have on? What are you clothed in? I thought it was interesting that he actually says to them, put away the foreign gods, we're going to bury them. Purify yourself. He even says, change your garments. You see, what you wear can even symbolize. In the spiritual realm, what you've allowed other people to put on you. What's been spoken over you. Maybe even the hurts that other people have that you've taken on as your identity. And I want to ask you, like, what are you wearing? Because it actually says that, that they need to change their garments. I think there's a lot of people in the church that need to change their garments. Because some of you are wearing things. Chris, you help me out. You're wearing things. No, I need, I, need, I need your jacket. Give me your jacket. 
Oh, she came in the tank top. Okay, guns. <laughs> Cover that up. Sheesh. Some of you are trying to put on garments that were not made for you. I put on that. This is as much as I can get it on. She's skinny, church. You've put on garments that were not made for you. And you're wearing that which someone else is carrying. You've taken on their offense. You've taken on their shame. You've taken on their spirit, their attitude towards the church. You've taken on their heart against God and you're you're wearing things that you were not meant to wear and then God's like okay now step up and walk into your destiny <laughs> all right God I'm ready use me use me God let's go I don't know if I could ball like this okay I can't get this off I'm serious help me She's mad. <laughs> but I wonder how many of us need to change the garments that we're wearing symbolically because of the spirit, the attitudes, the perspectives we've taken on that were never meant to be yours. It's time to change what you're wearing. The third response to our, or when our destiny feels defiled, is that we would confirm the covenant. Everybody say covenant. You see, covenant is a scriptural term, and if you don't know, the word testament means covenant. So when you read the Bible, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. See, God created a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he creates a covenant with Jacob. So Jacob isn't going off of good feelings right here, church. He's not going off of good vibes. He's not believing for greater things because of how he feels. No, he's doing it out of the covenant that he has between him and God. And I see it in, in Scripture that marriage is about covenant, not convenience. And I wonder how many things in our life we've allowed to or we've turned into something that's about convenience instead of covenant and God has called us to be a covenant people a covenant with God so Jacob has a covenant with God that God says I will be with you that's the covenant with Abraham Isaac and Jacob this is what God said I will be with you I will make you into a great nation this covenant is one that God would be with Jacob, but did you know we have a different covenant than God and Jacob had? You see, they had a Jacob and God covenant. There was a Jacob covenant, God will be with me, but we have a Jesus covenant that God will be in me. Hear me, church. Jacob saw God is with me, but now with Jesus, God is in me. You don't just walk with a God that follows you around. No, you walk with a God that's inside of you. You have the power of God inside of you. Everywhere you go, the power of God dwells in you, and you carry that with you everywhere you are. Jacob had a covenant. We have a Jesus covenant. Here's what it says, Jeremiah 31, just so I can prove it to you. Some of you are still wondering. Verse 32, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. This is what comes right after this. Next book, Genesis, Exodus, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their children are in bondage in Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. Everybody say, that's now. That's now. Declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds write it on their hearts I will be their God and they will be my people 
I don't have a Jacob covenant. I have a Jesus covenant that he's in me. And I wonder how many of us, the covenant with our struggle is greater than the covenant with our God. How many of you have covenanted with your struggle, with the defiling that you experienced? And it wasn't your doing. I'm not even blaming you. It was done to you. That spouse that said, till death do us part. And then cheated on you. Was unfaithful and then walked out on you. That job that said, we're going to see you move up the ladder. Then someone lied about you. And they fired you. That thing that was done to you as a child that you had no control over, but you were defiled. The problem is that some of us have made a covenant with the defiling. And our covenant with our defiling has become stronger than the covenant with our God. And then we wonder why our destiny only ever feels defiled. We wonder why our destiny only ever feels destroyed. It's because God is not looking at you saying, get over it. But he's looking at you and he's, he's urging you and pleading with you to let him heal it. Let him heal the defiling. And covenant with him so he can step you in to the true destiny and purpose that he has for your life. So confirm the covenant with God. And then finally, if the keys will come back, I'm going to close. If we're going to respond right when our destiny feels defiled, we have to remember what's in us. Remember what's in you. Remember what's in you, church. The defiling does not define you. And you've been defiled. So many in this place, you're thinking of that thing that was done. You're thinking of that person that hurt you. You're thinking of that person that abused you. You're thinking of that person that betrayed you. You're thinking of the things that have been said about you. It doesn't define you. You want to know what I realized? <laughs> and I think looking at Jacob's life, I realized it. Is that the battle, it's never been with all these external things. It's never even been with people. Like the battle that we all face, the battle that Jacob faced, it wasn't a battle with him and his brother Esau. It wasn't a battle with him and his father-in-law Laban who tricked him. It wasn't a battle with the men of Shechem, these Canaanites, these parasites that are coming for him. The battle was not with all that external stuff. And sometimes we make it that. The battle has always been within you. The battle was always within Jacob. There was a battle waging within him, within him and there's a battle, battle waging within you every day. The spirit and the flesh warring against one another. Because people will hurt us. People will defile us. People will betray us. We'll walk through storms. We'll walk through struggles. We'll walk through challenges. But the battle that God wants you to face is not with all those people or all those external things. He wants you to face the battle within. That I'm going to allow the spirit within me, the spirit man within me, to grow stronger. And the flesh I will starve. The flesh I will deny. That's what Jesus told us. He says, deny yourself 
take up your cross and follow me. It is a denial of self. It is a denial of even that which you've determined is your destiny. Because what I found is what I determined as my destiny when I was young, and I thought I was going to the NBA to help the Sacramento Kings make the playoffs. One went away, church. One went away. Come on. I've been declaring it this whole year. In Jesus' name, we will break the streak, and we are one went away. Oh, Caleb, get back in the spirit. That is flesh. But maybe it's the spirit of God. <laughs> but you know, the, the destiny that I saw for myself was so much different than the destiny that God saw for me. So even the defilings that have happened in my life, the defilings that happen in your life, it doesn't define your destiny, but it may be what sets you up for your destiny. Because God wants to use that which so many would claim could never be used. God wants to take that which, God, which others would say that was wasted. Because nothing is wasted with our God. He uses everything to determine the destiny that he has for us. So I don't know what you've been through, church. I know looking around this room and after the first service, so many people that talk to me about what they've gone through, the defilings they've experienced. I know there is pain, deep-rooted pain in this house. You've walked through so much. Things that you wouldn't even want to tell people. And yet God wants to tell you that defiling does not define you. And that defiling does not distract or detract from your destiny. Because I can use it. I can take it. I can redeem it. He redeems even the worst parts of us. The greatest pain, struggles, and hurts. Maybe even failures. We just have to remember what's in us. You see, I love here that he actually reminds him of his name again. He renames him again. Did you catch that when we read it? Because last week, Chrissy preached it. Didn't she? That after he wrestles with God, he wrestles in verse 28 of chapter 32, and God names him. He actually says to him, and he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. You've striven and you've prevailed. You made it. You didn't quit. You didn't give up. Can I just celebrate today that if you're here today, you haven't quit. You haven't given up. You haven't mailed it in. You haven't said, I'm done. You maybe said it at times, but you're here because some part of you is still striving and seeking after God. You maybe don't even know why you're in here today. God brought you here. He wanted you to hear this, and he's speaking to your soul and your heart right now. He's saying, I'm not done with you yet. So Jacob strives. He doesn't quit. God renames him. And yet, it happens again here in chapter 35. I'm like, he already got renamed. Why is he reminding him of his name again? Verse 10, God says to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come from his or your own body. You see, Israel wasn't just a name, it was a nation. And I feel like God wanted to just encourage somebody in this place. You've forgotten what's in you. But I want to tell you, I want to challenge you that you would not let what's put on you kill what's in you. The defiling that was put on you cannot kill what's in you. The failure that's put on you cannot kill what's in you. The shame of the failure that people continue to speak on you because of what happened way back then cannot kill what's in you. 
Because today, God wanted to remind you, the gift has always been in you. The Spirit of God is in you. The destiny and the purpose that God has for you is in you. You just have to decide today, am I going to allow God to keep leading me into what he has for my life? I will not be defined by the defiling that has been spoken over me, done to me, put on me. No, what's in me is greater. You see, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And the world is trying to speak a lot of things over your life. But he's greater. So, you know, as I close right now, I, I saw that Jacob, after he takes these foreign gods and he takes these rings, he buries them under the tree at Shechem. And I think that there's some defiling today that you need to bury. You need to bury. You've allowed it to define you all these years. You've allowed it to distract and detract from the destiny that God has for you. And today in this house, somebody needs to bury it. Just bury it. You don't forget, but it doesn't define you any longer. You bury it under the tree at Shechem and you go to the promised land that God has for your life. The destiny and the purpose that God has for you, church. Let's bury it. It's done. It happened. It doesn't define you. But God can use it.